We're going to move now on to our next speaker, and uh, the reason I've moved rather speedily into getting the speakers in front of you is because a few people said to me last night, there wasn't enough time for discussion at the end. So I do want to make sure that you've got enough time for discussion after the three speakers uh, have presented. Uh, for anybody who is live streaming, and also those of you in the room who would like to, there are uh, a couple of ways you can send questions if you'd rather not wave your hand at the end of the speaking. Uh, we've got Facebook and um, tweet addresses up there. I, I said that wrong, isn't it? Twitter? No, just Twitter. Thank you. They'll modernise me at some point. Look out. <laughs> so for our second speaker, I'm very pleased to introduce Judge Carrie Wainwright, who is here with us. Uh, Judge Wainwright, uh, we've got her on the program as my Tangy Tribunal, but in actual fact, she's had a very long and wonderful history of, of, of representing us with New Zealand, or, sorry, as New Zealand, in terms of the Māori Land Court, the Waitangi Tribunal, uh, and she's now at the District Court, where I understand uh, you're doing quite an interesting inquiry. I'm going to try and pronounce it their way. Hwanganui. Did I do okay? It's not bad, is it? Great. Whanganui District Inquiry. I must admit I am one of those people who always watches with fascination on television to see how they pronounce that. So many iterations, isn't there? So thankfully Ngāti Fata was slightly easier for me to pronounce. I'll stick to my own. Um, so really lovely to welcome you here tonight and um, thank you for coming to talk to us about uh, the Māori Magna Carta, Waitangi and Beyond. Judge Carrie Wainwright. Uh, kia ora mai tātou. Fai hua ki au e nei uh, kōrero, e nei whakāro e pāna ki tērā pepa nui, the Magna Carta. Nā reira, he nui aku mihi ki a koutou katoa i runga i te āhuatanga o tēnei pō hōhonu. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you all for coming. Now, I could say many things about the Treaty of Waitangi because I have spent a great deal of my professional life thinking about it, but you'll be relieved to know that um, I'm only going to venture upon a corner of it tonight. And I should also add that I have not spent much of my professional life thinking about the Magna Carta. However, lately my contemplations have been trending in that direction. I have been toying with the idea that for some people, for some New Zealanders, it might be relevant or even cogent to look at our colonial past through a lens other than the Treaty of Waitangi. And I'd like to suggest that a possible alternative lens is the Magna Carta, which 800 years ago as we all know, introduced the legal norm that the rulers and the ruled ruled must comply with the same law. Now, this is a lens that is not unrelated to the treaty because in Article 3, um, Māori have all the rights and benefits of British citizens, and those rights, of course, include the brilliant and moral Magna Carta precept that the same consistent set of ascertainable laws applies to everybody. And that right there was an exit route from tyranny and became the cornerstone of democracy. So here in New Zealand, who are the rulers? Well, when the colony of New Zealand began, the uh, rulers were embodied in the person of the crown, which effectively meant the state. And in our colonial past, and even, dare I say, occasionally today, the crown has engaged in conduct vis-a-vis -vis te iwi Māori that the Waitangi Tribunal, in its numerous reports, has famously found wanting. Now, the Waitangi Tribunal, of course, doesn't apply the Magna Carta. It sets as a standard for Crown conduct the one that Parliament set, namely compliance with the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Those principles have a common root of good faith, fair dealing and proper process. And I've been privileged over the last um, 15 years to be among those who've created 
the jurisprudence of the tribunal uh, that has those principles as its core. However, there is no denying that for some, the principles of the treaty occupy a legal space that can seem amorphous, more amorphous than some lawyers feel comfortable with, because the principles come out of the vast power imbalance that has come to pass through colonisation and from the fact that the treaty essentially failed as a means of protecting the interests of tangata whenua. So those principles are political as well as legal, and perhaps that is why their critics label them as airy-fairy and presentist and say that they're not firmly rooted in general legal principle. So I think it's useful to see that if you set the principles for now to one side and instead look at the failures of the Crown, the acts of the Crown that were most egregious, and we look at them through the Magna Carta lens, we see that we don't actually require any principles of the treaty to find those actions, those failures wanting. The situations arose because the Crown's representatives did not apply to the Crown and its transactions with Māori, the very law that underpinned the foundation of the new colony. Now, I've only got 10 minutes to address you on this topic, so I'm going to leap straight into examples that I hope will illuminate what I'm trying to talk about. And the examples I'm going to use come from the area of Whanganui, where I led the Waitangi Tribunal's district inquiry, and we're just coming to the end of the very long process of writing our report. Now, you all know there were huge purchases of land from Māori in the 19th century. And the incomers to these islands, the Pahia, saw land as the chief asset of Māori. But from the Māori point of view, and from the point of view of their culture, land defined who they were in terms of whakapapa and in terms of their creation through Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. So by any standard, it was vital that the process of converting the customary land interests of, of a tangata whenua into legal title, and then subsequently their purchase, it was vital that that process was robust and fair. But in many cases it wasn't. The, col the colonists applied different standards altogether to acquiring Māori land than they would have applied to acquiring land that Pahia owned. And it was the Crown that conducted these huge purchases. The treaty made the Crown the only show in town when it came to purchasing Māori land. And that was a circumstance that put the Crown in a very privileged position, one that you might think would have placed on it an obligation to meet a high standard of conduct. But as it turned out, no. In Whanganui, there was a purchase in 1848 eponymously called the Whanganui Purchase. And the Crown acquired 89,000 acres. The Crown was actually following up on a shonky purchase that the New Zealand Company had negotiated directly with Māori before the treaty was signed. And uh, what happened was that a commission was set up to look into purchases that had happened before the treaty. And when the commissioner did that, he said that the company had bought 40,000 acres. So it fell to the Crown to conclude the purchase. The land was surveyed, and the Crown quietly expanded the area to 89,000 acres while paying the owners of the land for 40,000 acres. So where does the Magna Carta come in? Well, the Crown did not apply to itself English law applying to land transactions. The law required, as a minimum, that you'd have a willing buyer and a willing seller, that the parties would know what was in the bargain, and they would have the ability to negotiate the price. So even if we put aside the proper identification of who the people were who were entitled to sell the land, and that was always 
a tricky area for the Crown, who usually performed poorly, how could the vendors know what was in the bargain, that is, what land they were selling, when there had been no survey? And then when the survey was done and the Crown representatives realised that the true extent of the land was 89,000 acres, it paid only for 40,000 acres. And then if we move into the 1880s, by this time the colony was much better developed and arguably the uh, Crown had fewer excuses for engaging in poor process. It set about the purchase of an even larger area of land, and it was called the Waimarino Block. This was the biggest block that the Crown bought in the North Island. It was vast. It occupied 1,145 square kilometres, and it stretched from Taumarunui in the north to just south of Raiatehi to the summit of Ruapehu. And when the Crown set about buying up individuals' interests in that land, the block hadn't been surveyed. So the Crown did not, as the law said it should, wait for the native land court to say which Māori owned which land, and it did not wait for a survey. The Crown purchase agents were under instructions to buy up as much land as they could as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible for they needed that land for the construction of the North Island main trunk, which was at that time the foremost policy of the government. So the Crown Purchase Agents went out and they bought up interests from individual Māori for a fixed price at a time when the Māori owners simply could not know what they were selling because what they owned had not yet been defined and so they didn't know how many interests they owned in the land and they didn't know where their interests were. The Crown agents would not tell the Māori vendors how much they were paying them per acre because the Crown agents didn't know how many acres there were. And they were under instructions to keep the price to a minimum. So they simply handed over to each individual interest holder an amount of money to cover whatever the interests were that they turned out to own. And in that block, in the Waimarino block, an unusually high proportion of the owners were children. Now the law specified a process that involved the Governor General in Council appointing trustees for minors. But this would have taken way too long. So the officials asked the court to bypass the formalities so that the Crown's purchase activities wouldn't be delayed. And the agent, agents for the Crown brought up nearly all the miners' interests over the course of a few months from people who were not appointed according to law. So these two purchases, the Whanganui Purchase and the Waimarino Purchase in the Whanganui District, are clear examples of how the impact of colonisation, which if you look around the world, you will note is always a brutal process for the colonised, how that was exacerbated when the Crown failed to regulate its own conduct in conformity with the norm that it too was subject to the law, the norm for which we have the Magna Carta to think. So when we try to address the question, what did Māori get out of colonisation? The light of civilization supposedly imported with the English should have had as its most intense and brightly burning part the light of the rule of law, a fair, impartial system of laws and obligations to which all were equally bound. And if the colonisers had maintained their focus on that gift of the Magna Carta, the worst treaty breaches that the Waitangi Tribunal investigates today would have been many fewer. Kia ora tato. So engrossed, I forgot my paperwork. Thank you so much. That is intriguing. And I'm really looking forward to reading that report.